Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Justin Dennison, and we are back in CompTIA Network Plus land. More specifically, we're going to be looking at some cloud concepts today. And luckily, we have a very special individual in the studio today to lead us, to guide us, to be our, our one and only Mr. Wes Bryan. How are you doing today, Wes? Hey, I'm doing great, Justin. Thanks for having me out, uh, back here. And that is right. We're going to put our heads in the clouds, right? Uh, but uh, more importantly, you know, what, what is the cloud? Well, the cloud... It's an interesting thing. You say, well, where does the cloud reside? Well, the cloud resides a little here and a little there, and I'm really just a little bit of everywhere. Essentially, what you're doing is you're, you're paying a provider, and you're using some form of their resources, right? Whether it be maybe network components, maybe it would be development environments, right? Firewalls. You're essentially paying another provider, and they provide you with a service. So, Wes, a real quick question about those services. Like when you say service, that, that seems like a very broad term. What are some services that, if I'm paying a provider, what am I getting back? Well, that, that's, a great, uh, that's a great question, Justin, in the fact that I guess it really just depends on what you need. All right. When it boils down, we typically have three different kinds of services, three of the common services. Uh, you know, I want you to understand that uh, there are more and more services being added uh, probably as we speak right now, and we don't even know it, but uh, they call out on the exam three of the main services, uh, offerings, if you will, that have been around for a while. The very first one that we're going to talk about, you probably use and have used for a while, and maybe you didn't even know it. Maybe you didn't even know that that's what you were doing, right? I want you to think of your email service, right? I haven't really paid for an email service in a very long time, uh, but uh, I do get the ability of sending emails. Well, who is it that manages and maintains that? Well, it depends on which provider you're talking about, but for the most part, I use Gmail, right? Uh, Gmail, Google's Gmail, if you will, uh, but we have things like Hotmail that are, I know it's Outlook.com today, right? You have things like Ymail, or you used to call it Yahoo Mail, right? Uh, but these providers are essentially giving you a service, basically allowing you to use their application. And that's one of the first offerings. In fact, I've got a little uh, a slide here or a diagram here, and it's what's known as software as a service, right? Uh, software as a service, you've probably seen it uh, abbreviated before, S-A-A-S, right? Um, this is where you have a provider, and they are essentially going to uh, manage and maintain applications, and they're going to let you access their applications, again, provided as a service. Now, sometimes you... You get a free service. Sometimes you don't have to pay. But on a business side of things, if you're going for, like we use here at IT Pro TV, we use Office 365, right? Microsoft's software as a service offering, or a portion of it, right? They've got a lot of different services that they provide. But it gives you an example, right? So for instance, I can log into a web interface. And that's one of the great things about software, uh, you know, the, the software as a service, uh, is that a lot of times with software as a service, if we're using an application, we access it through a web browser. And that's great. Why? Because the web browser is commonly built into your devices. Most of your devices that you use will have some form of web browser built right into them. Now, that doesn't mean that in using software as a service that you're only going to go through a web browser. A lot of times they have standalone apps too that allow you to perform the same functionality, but at least it allows you that functionality without additional applications. Um, the one of the great things about this too is that if you are using an application, again, software as a service, they're maintaining the updates. They maintain things like, uh, you know, as the platform develops, you don't have to worry about that. They maintain it. They give you things like redundancy. And uh, for the most part, a lot of times you don't even see outages, right? So that's a, that's a great thing. And as a company, it is, uh, sometimes it's inconvenient if you have a very, very small IT staff, which a lot of companies do, uh, and maybe you don't want to maintain an on-premise server. All right, that's what we call a local resource, and that relationship between local resources and cloud resources just essentially says that if I have local resources, we're going to have to, my company's going to have to manage and maintain them. And if I have an email server and I want access to an email platform, well, guess what? We've got to deploy or install, if you will, that email client across every one of our devices that it's going to connect back to our email server and then we're going to have it to have a systems administrator that manages and maintains that server which means there's a potential that you could have downtime if something on that server fails all right so that's another one of the benefits that you are offloading that basically to the service provider 
and they provide you that service for whatever the fee might be. Uh, so that is one of the, the, the very first services that I want you to be aware of. And again, like I said, you've probably used it before and maybe didn't even know it. Now, uh, the next service that we have is what is known as infrastructure. Infrastructure as a service, right? Now, with infrastructure as a service, I got a little diagram here just to kind of show what IAAS does, right? This provides things like your computational, your computing resources. All right, uh, things like, for instance, your memory, your storage, things like networking communications, your operating systems, your servers. And you might be saying, well, we give you a physical server? No, not really, because one of the things you have to keep in mind that almost go hand in hand is virtualization technologies, which we'll talk about in other episodes, and cloud-based technologies, right? Um, I want you to think about the ability to, uh, or, or maybe you require, you require setting up uh, web servers, right? Uh, for redundancy, you want to set up maybe a web server farm, so you want to have multiple web servers. Well, that takes a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of resources, a lot of money has to be invested in the, into those devices, a lot of power concerns, if you will. Imagine the ability to offload that service to somebody else, all right, to another provider. And they, in the background, have the servers, have the networking cables, have uh, you know, the memory, the storage, and they maintain that for you, right? The other great thing about things like infrastructure as a service is rapid deployment, right? I don't have to wait for a server to come in, sit it in the server closet, still in the box, and let it acclimate itself to the server, server room temperature before I take it out, and I, then we install it, right? Once we install it in the rack mounts, then we install the operating system, right? Just for a single server, it can be a lot. But imagine the ability to just spin up an instance of a device and say, I want this amount of memory, I want this amount of storage, I want it to communicate with this type of device over the network, and we're ready to go. And somebody else is maintaining it. That's one of the great things of infrastructure as a service is that we can have multiple operating systems, different server platforms, if you will, network communication, storage, and memory. Now, Wes, isn't some, those are all incredible uh, kind of wonderful features of infrastructure as a service. I think one of the things that stick out to me is I actually gain access to hardware that is updated and kind of outside of my range. Case in point, do a little bit of programming. GPU computing is all the rage. You can actually gain access to GPUs that are like 60 grand a pop. Well, I didn't have to buy a GPU that was 60 grand and put it in my server and go, I hope it works. I can actually more or less rent out space on one for a small time just to try things out and I don't have to worry about all the shenanigans associated with that. And most definitely, and you can do it rapidly too, and I'm sure you've probably had to do that before where maybe somebody's called you and said, hey Justin, I need this program running on these machines at this time and they need to be available right away. That's the great thing as infrastructure as a service is the fact that you do have access to the technologies. Another one to kind of piggyback off of that too, Justin, is when you think about storage. Right? Um, I want a one terabyte solid state drive. Okay, sure, no problem. For about eight to nine hundred dollars, you can have one of those and you can install them, or you can pay a storage tier, right? You can pay a little bit higher and they've got those. They've got those solid state drives already in the background waiting for you. You just need to pay them a little bit extra money and only for what you need. All right, or maybe I didn't need a one terabyte. Maybe I didn't need a one terabyte SSD. I only needed one that was about 500 gigs, but they only had one available at the time that was one terabyte, right? So it alleviates that. You don't have to worry about that underlying hardware, and I'm glad you mentioned that too, is the fact that you get, uh, you, you get access to the latest and greatest, and the service provider man, uh, maintains uh, the patching of the systems, if you will, inside, uh, in the background, and that's all transparent to the end user. All right, so we have one more, and I know you, you, this one I'm going uh, to throw back to you here in a second, Justin. This is platform as a service, right? Uh, and platform as, as a service has a great, uh, it's a great offering here. And if you look, you know, just generically, platform as a service, you know, it essentially gives uh, developers, right, a thing, things like application runtime and execution environment, if you will, uh, as well as the infrastructure to support things like computational resources when you couple that with things like IAAS, um, development teams, dev teams, you know, they can work with a common, uh, a lot of the different common programming languages that are out there, and it makes it a lot easier. We can have our dev team that has in access to the environments that they need, and sometimes they don't even have to go get 
our IT staff anymore, right? Because that's one of the things that you would have to do. You know, we talk about dev, DevOps, right? Operations and development team working together. We have to have an IT admin that's sitting there waiting to spin up an instance, uh, or not even an instance, spin up a server that supports the platform that they need for that moment. But then what if it changes? Well, now we've got to tear it down. We've got to put in maybe another operating system, maybe another platform altogether in order to support something else. So it gives you that flexibility. Uh, now, I know you with uh, programming and stuff, have you worked with things like platform as service? Uh, so I, I can actually give you a, kind of a comparison because we I've dealt with some on-prem stuff where we have a server uh, or we have a rack of servers and we're trying to do some computationally expensive things. We have uh, our RAID array and that, that's all fun. But now every one of those servers, we have to Oh, I need to make sure that the Python runtime's there. I need to make sure that all the versions match. I need to, oh, you know what? Server 2 just went down. Something messed up. I got to make sure that I reinstall the operating system, come back, make sure that Python matches. And it was a lot of maintenance. And it provided very, it was more focused on maintaining the infrastructure than it was rapid development of these technologies that we're trying to do. Essentially, they were across multiple nodes. They were like distributed applications. Well, when we move to platform as a service, hey, I need something that will run Python code and has this storage, right? It, we used a little bit of infrastructure as a service to do this. But once it was done, we could take it up, tear it down, not have to worry about anything. It was reproducible. It increased our, our runtime. It also, from a business perspective, it allowed us to not, no offense, to not necessarily at the time employ like sysadmins or, or right. anyone who... We're just trying to do some prototype and R&D. We don't need someone going, well, do you need a, an, an instance now or how about now? We can do it all ourselves until we figured out what we needed. And then at that point, hey, we need you to maintain this, keep an eye on it, maybe pay your duty or something like that. But it was incredibly empowering versus, ah, oh, server two went down on, in, in the server room again. Uh, go turn it off and turn it back on. Yeah, that's right. Reboots fix everything. And then, you know, the great thing is, is that you can alleviate a lot of that stress and you can offload all of that again to the provider. You can probably start to see that, hey, cloud is here. It's going to be around for a while. It's only getting bigger, if you will. Uh, uh, so definitely uh, be aware of those. All right. So um, next thing that we got to talk about is, uh, you know, the delivery models. When we talk about cloud delivery models, there are uh, really three types that they, they call out. All right, one of them is public. Now, public cloud offering is where you have something like Microsoft's Azure, right? You have Amazon's AWS as an example, right? Where everybody has access to that, that um, you know, th those platforms and those services, hence the term why they call it the public cloud. But then you also have a private cloud. All right, and a private cloud might be something, i give you an example here, right, where maybe you've got a company and the company has two uh, local area networks, right, and they have a, a few servers, maybe a few databases, and they maintain all of their data. They let their, uh, if you will, uh, uh, users and development team, if you will, all access their internal resources. Now, this is called a private cloud because if this was my company, right, and I owned it, I'm going to maintain all the equipment, right? So you could consider like, for instance, these huge data centers that some companies own internally to themselves could be considered a private cloud, all right? Now, you also have what's known as the hybrid cloud, and the hybrid cloud is another common one where maybe you have a private cloud, but for certain things, maybe you need to access uh, you know, the public cloud as well. And again, that's why it's called the hybrid, right, uh, is the fact that you're using some private cloud uh, uh, technologies, which is uh, all the regular cloud technologies. It's just not accessible by anybody, just maintained internally by the company. But at the same time, maybe the company has also figured out that, hey, they could use some software as a service, right? Maybe they don't want to spend the time that it takes to deploy, maintain, and update. You mentioned uh, updates there, uh, you know, like a, like a productivity application. So we go ahead and we deploy it through software as a service. We still get our private cloud information, the stuff that's going to be maintained internally and only accessible by us. But then we also get the public offering as well, where we can go to something like, uh, you know, Office 365, uh, if you will, uh, Google Docs, if you will, uh, as well. And then we have portions of the public cloud that we're also accessing as well. Now, Wes, would you say that a hybrid cloud, like if I had an internal, on-prem, kind of everything set up, 
but then my backups are actually persisted to some cloud technology. Would that be considered a hybrid kind of deployment process? Most definitely. If you are, it's a, it's a great example. And um, uh, if you are maintaining, again, your internal, you know, your internal cloud service and it's not accessible by anybody else and you're just taking those backups for good disaster recovery plan, right? and somebody else is maintaining and managing those, then you could consider that a form of a hybrid uh, type delivery model. Anytime you mix private and public clouds together, you end up getting what they call the hybrid. Now with connectivity methods, there's a, there's a few different uh, connectivity methods that you have. A couple of the common ones, uh, one of them I kind of had in the diagram where it's a VPN communication that you set up. So for instance, if it's a private cloud, uh, and you've got multiple local area networks, you've got a WAN links between them, you could set up like a VPN communication and then you can encrypt all the information that goes through the VPN communication. You could go to, like for instance, uh, an internet backbone provider, right? Now, kind of like an ISP, but uh, think about it as being way up there on the totem pole when we say, you know, uh, they call them um, internet backbone providers, IBPs, not ISPs, right? Uh, and you like for instance, going to level three, Right, and then you get that high speed, quite literally high speed network backbone that you're on that gives you fast access to uh, the cloud-based technologies. Or it could be like we do here in, you know, in Gainesville. It could be just a normal internet service provider or a telecommunications company and you're just basically doing no different than you would in a residential neighbor where, neighborhood, right, where you connect to your ISP's network and then from there you connect to the cloud, right? That would be the same type of connection that you could have here uh, likewise. Now, there are some things that we have to um, understand the benefits of cloud technology. Some of them we've already mentioned. Justin's mentioned some of them when it comes to deployment of software. Some of the things that you can keep in mind is that, you know, you don't have to worry about the, uh, supporting the infrastructure. The service provider has the infrastructure and they support that in infrastructure as well as provide you the services through that infrastructure. You get scalability. Scalability, being able to scale out when you need it, right? Being able to say, hey, I need 10 additional web servers. Why? Because we're getting close to Black Friday. Right now, I don't need those web servers, but you know what? Black Friday comes, I need those web servers. Now, does my company want to invest the money that it takes to bring up 10 additional servers that we're going to use for one day in the entire year? Well, we can scale out, sure, but it also gives what's known as elasticity. Elasticity is the ability, think about a rubber band, to scale out and then scale down when you need it, right? Once, uh, once Black Friday's done, I don't need those 10 additional servers. I don't want the cost that it would take, what is it, three-year ROI, I think it is, return on investment on, on a server, you know, three years, maybe five years, depending on what your model is, uh, just for one server, and you bought 10 of them, and you know you only needed them for one day, right? That's another benefit of the cloud, right? As information as, or uh, excuse me, um, infrastructure as a service, I could say, okay, on Black Friday or just prior to Black Friday, uh, us kicking off our Black Friday sale, we're going to go ahead and we're going to deploy 10 servers and we can spin them up really quick, have them ready, again, scalability, scale out, and then reduce that down when Black Friday is no longer here that following Saturday. We don't need those servers anymore. We can scale back down. So you get the rapid scalability, elasticity, you get the always on too, all right? One of the things that you'll find out is that with the majority of these platforms, now they might not have the, create, the, the crazy five nine high availability, but they will get uh, you know, a few nines in there, right? And it's according to your SLA, your service level agreement. Uh, so you also get high availability, right? You get uh, redundancy and recovery. Uh, things like, for instance, Amazon's platform, they move entire, they have geographical areas that are set up like huge grids that um, you don't even know that there's a failure. You can look at a service health report and you can find out, oh, I think there was an outage, but you might not be aware. You could be, but you're, you might not be aware of it. Scheduled updates and maintenance, we've kind of already talked about. Expense allocation, all right? This is a great way to say, hey, I needed 10 servers for, for whatever, 24 hours, and then we scale it back down. All right, well, now we could do chargeback. And we know uh, we, could, we could do metering, if you will, charge metering a lot, lot easier. Uh, and then last but not least is, uh, well, environmental impact, right? Think about the extra power it takes to maintain those servers in a server closet that you would have on constantly, right? So you can, if, you, if that's something that you're into, you can think about reducing your overall carbon footprint too. Now there are some security implementations uh, or implications, I should say, uh, things that you have to consider. Um, 
Anytime you're using a, a public cloud solution, you have what's known as multi-tenancy. Multi-tenancy just means that you know that you have more than one company that is going to use that, that, that cloud, that provider. Right? I, I couldn't tell you how many, as big as Amazon or AWS is, couldn't tell you how many thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of customers they have, but they're multiple customers within a single platform. It's called multi-tenancy. So you have to pay attention to how they, they handle that, right? Because you don't have to worry about uh, virtual environment uh, escaping techniques, right? So there are security concerns that we have to be aware of. Uh, privacy, right? You have to pay attention to the privacy and the service level agreements, right? Data location could be another thing that might be important to you as well, especially if you're talking about data standards, right? Uh, what is customer, uh, uh, you know, what is customer data versus the company data, PII, if we have personally identifiable information. If we're worried about things like PCI, DSS, or the payment card uh, information, data security standards, right? Do we have to follow under things like HIPAA compliance? Well, then we have to look and we have to read those laws. We have to be aware of the information security standards and make sure that if you are using a cloud provider and like, you know, you, uh, you use the example of backing that information up to the cloud. Where is it stored? Is it stored in a secure location? Who has access to it? You don't know. That's things that you need to find out and that's also things that you need to secure before you decide what you're going to store in the cloud and what you're not going to store in the cloud, right? If they're local resources, they're on-prem. You mentioned that term on-prem. On-premise, that means you're managing and maintaining them and you can secure them a little bit better. When you move them up to the cloud and they become a cloud-based resource, it's up to you to read the documentation to make sure that the data that you put up in the cloud does maintain its level of security. These are just a few of the topics when it comes, and we really just scratch the surface with the cloud. Keep in mind that they are adding all different types of as a services, storage as a service, security as a service, right? many more database as a service. So these are just some, three of the most common ones that we want you to be aware of and network plus, on the Network Plus exam, and so does CompTIA. Well, Wes, you've definitely illuminated some of the things that we need to consider when using cloud-based uh, technology. So thank you so much for that. Now, before we depart for this episode, are there any final parting words of wisdom uh, from you? Yeah, just get the jargon. I think that's the big thing is just get the jargon, um, you know, under your belt when it comes to uh, you know, taking this exam or when you prepare for this exam. Uh, and just be aware of, you know, some scenarios that they might ask you and ask you which service is this. All right. If, if uh, company A can access that information but no other company can access the information, is this an example of a private cloud or a public cloud or a hybrid cloud? Be able to know these different models, these different services, so that next time you, uh, you know, when you sit that Net Plus exam and they come up with a question, you'll be able to answer every one. Well, Wes, thank you for illuminating those, those wonderful words of wisdom, those little nuggets that we can take away as we prepare for CompTIA Network Plus. But we're continuing on, so definitely stay tuned. But for this episode, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. So signing off for IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Justin Dennison. And I'm Wes Bryan. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.